Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I wrote this code. I'm not sure whether someone else can read it because it's in this old Fortran thing. But I'm old, so that's OK. So um, I wanted to say, please interrupt me at any time if there is a question. I also know that I tend to put too much information on one slide. Not as much as you do, Doug, but still. So if, there, if, if you have a question, then just interrupt me at any time. Good, uh, so what is the outline of this talk? I'm first going to give you an introduction on the population synthesis principle. Then I will talk about some input physics that we put in these models. This is, uh, since we tried to put a lot, I cannot address everything, but I will address uh, some of it. Then I will talk about results. First, statistical results on masses, and then statistical results on radii, and finally, I will give you my conclusions. So let's go to the introduction. I mean, what we, what we currently see, and I think this is very exciting, is that we have really a huge increase of detection number of uh, known exosolar planets, both from the space and from ground. I remember when I was a PhD student, we had a comparison sample for the population synthesis of 36 giant planets. And if there was one more, we added it immediately to the database. But OK, these times are over. Now we really have a lot, and more are to come. Right? I have put here a, a number of the, all the missions that are coming online which are already online nowadays. Due to this, uh, all these observations, I think that the field in total is, is, is rather observation driven and the theory rather struggles to interpret and to understand all these uh, um, observations. And in principle, this is, this is yeah, it, it would be nice to, use, to be able to use all this information, like we heard also in the first talk of, of Scott at the very beginning. But the, the problem is, I, I think, that it often it is relatively difficult to, uh, to constrain planet formation theory directly from the observation. And why is that? That's because planet formation theory consists of many, many different sub-theories. One for the accretion of gas, for the accretion of solids, for migration, and so on. And they all interact with each other. Therefore, the, the observation, they all only give us the global picture, how they all interact. And this is, therefore, it's not easy to go from the observation to one specific physical effect. But I think this high number is, is now really the chance where we can make progress because thanks to that, we can now look at the populations, at the planets, no more as single object, but really as a population which is characterized by statistical properties, like the distribution of the masses, radii, semi-major axis. And especially because now we have observational data, not only from radial velocity, but also from Kepler, so the radii. We will soon have more data from direct imaging, microlensing, and they all probe different parts of the, uh, of the parameter space where planets are, and therefore also how they have formed. And if we can combine that, then we can, I think, uh, you learn much better something about planet formation. And this is what population synthesis is really all about. It is a tool that we can learn from the observation something about the theory of planet formation and improve our understanding. And the essence of the planet uh, population synthesis method is a, a, a so-called global planet formation model or end-to-end -end model, so something which tries to put together the simplified uh, description of many different physical processes. And uh, I tend to show that with this kind of, uh, how do you say the name, distill, distillery, distill, distillation. So you need to have some, uh, of course, the detailed, the specialized models, and we heard of a number of them in the previous talks. But then uh, what you do then in, in, in population synthesis, of course, you lose uh, the subtleties, but you try to keep the essence. And what you have in the end is a concentrate of many different effects, and this hopefully lets you to see the big picture and make the comparison with an observation. The difficulty here is, of course, how strongly should we distill in this process so that we still can capture the physics. And this is just one example. This is about how do we describe the protoplanetary disk. We all know, in principle, we should use some uh, radiation magnetohydrodynamic simulations in 3D, but this is, of course, not possible to run during a, a long time scale. Therefore, there are, we can maybe distill it back to something like that. We'll come back to that later. So we describe it in 1D, just a radial dimension, and we treat it as a viscous fluid. Or we can distill it or simplify it even more, so we use just the power law and some exponential decrease. And this is what you, by the way, use in the, in the simple 
simple toy model you're using in the hand on session. So working on this here is, is a part of, of what I'm, I'm, I'm doing, uh, trying to, to make this kind of, of simplification, but still having the important information. Once we have that, so, and you saw that uh, this kind of, of plot already uh, in, in the hands-on session, so we have this global formation model which gives us the link between the disk properties and the planetary properties. And this is, in observationally, this is often not directly possible, so we need the models to make this link. Then the second most ingredient, most important ingredient to population synthesis are this distribution of initial conditions, because uh, the idea is that we, 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 the diversity of the observed exoplanets is a consequence of the diversity of the initial conditions, which are, of course, the protoplanetary disk. You heard about that in the earlier talk on these properties. There is a big diversity also there. So what you then just do, you draw from these initial conditions. That's what you will be doing uh, this afternoon. And you compute your synthetic planet population. Uh, then you apply some observation detection bias because you will see that you produce a lot of very low mass planets which currently we cannot detect and this gives then the, the subpopulation of the detectable synthetic planets. And here then of course the observed population comes in and then you can make all kinds of comparisons between the actual and the synthetic subpopulation and uh, the most important uh, comparisons are of course mass distance diagram, distribution of masses and all these things. And usually and you will see that these two things are different. But this is not really the problem. Actually, this is, this is what it's all about. Because then you go and go back into your model and try to understand what, which physical uh, description is the one that you need to improve in order to get something which is closer to the observed population. Sometimes you also find uh, a population which is at least in some aspect similar as the observation and then you can do something which is interesting let's say in the in the context of the planning of missions because you can make uh, predictions about planets that cannot be observed nowadays that but could be uh, detect, detected by future missions. So in the first part I will now concentrate on the in some of the input physics in these global models and you already learned, I mean, part of that is repetition of what we saw in the hands-on session yesterday. And um, the first modern planet population mon uh, synthesis model was the one by Shigeru Ida and Doug Lin in, back in 2004. And I will just uh, go through what they included in this model. So we have a disk model with a power law and an exponential decrease. That's the same as in the, uh, in the, t uh, in the toy model. Then the accretion of solids is described by the Savranov equation and then some isolation masses uh, to have the, the end of the accretion. The accretion of gas was this parametrization by the kelvin helmholtz timescale. That's also what we use in the toy model. Uh, the termination of gas accretion was modeled by either the formation of the gap, so you stop accreting when you form a gap, and we heard this happens about when the hill sphere radius of the planet becomes bigger than the vertical scale height. Um, they initially considered that there is only one embryo draw, growing per disk, and we also did that like that in our model. And one of the big steps in the, in the second generation of population synthesis models, which were created in the last two years or so, was to include the mutual uh, interaction between the concurrently forming protoplanets. They use uh, a kind of a semi-analytical prescription for which is based on orbital crossing timescales. We use a direct end body, as we will see later on. And then finally, uh, the orbits. Doug mentioned that the big new thing is this migration. Of course, therefore, they included migration. And this was type 1 and type, uh, uh, type 2 uh, uh, disk migration, only disk-driven migration. And the Monte Carlo var variable, so the, the initial conditions which vary, this uh, was the position of the embryo that you put in. That's exactly the same as in our toy model. Then the disk mass, that's also the same. The dust to gas ratio for us, this is the metallicity which you can change. And finally, the disk lifetime. This is also one of the initial conditions. I mean, our toy model is relatively similar or quite similar. Uh, to the, this kind of models they had in 2004. And what you can see here, of course, what was the main result from this, from this kind of simulation is that even if you use always exactly the same input physics and you vary the initial conditions over a range, which should really occur in nature because the probability distribution are derived from disk observation, you can see that you get this big diversity in, the planetary out in outcomes of the formation process. 
there was not only diversity, there was also some trends. For example, there is this empty part here, the so-called planetary desert. We'll come back to that later on. They also had the metallicity effect, so the correlation between the metallicity of the host star and the disk and the frequency of giant planets. Um, they also studied here different laws for determination of the gas accretion. This is one of the exercise groups, and they also looked at different effects of type 2 and type 1 migration, which is another uh, exercise group. So in our own model, uh, it's a little bit different. Our own model at the beginning was just a simple giant planet formation model, like the Pollock et al. model, and this is this part here. So what you model here, and in the meantime, it has grown terribly complex. Whenever we have a new student, a PhD student, he, he goes, oh no, it's thousands of lines, I cannot understand it. And it's also for me, myself, it's, it's, it's not always simple to see what is really going on, because you have all this interaction. You have really all this interaction. And just to go quickly through it, what we have here on one hand is first a model for the structure of the protoplanetary disk. And then we have here a model. So we have the vertical structure of the disk, the radial structure of the disk, and the disk of the planetesimals or solids or, or pebbles or whatever you want. Then the, this, all this part here then describes one single planet. It describes especially the gas envelope, describes the accretion rate of solids, the interaction of the planetesimals with the protoplanet, then the atmosphere, the outer boundary conditions. During the evolutionary phase, we have some uh, atmospheric escape. This is for the structure of the core. And then finally up here, we have the interaction, first with the gas disk, and then with the planet where we have a normal n-body integrator. And I think here I would like to make a point which is very important. Sometimes people think of population synthesis model, at least of this one, of something which is written or mostly by uh, us. Actually, all these parts are just standard, well-known, published models which are put together. So there is not much more Dazzini or Oliver or Benz or something. It's just, I think, this would be probably Doug Lynn. This here would be Pollock. This here would be Tristan Guillot. Uh, this here would be Lyndon Bell. So it's just all these models put together. And um, I will now discuss some of them. And the first one I would like to uh, go into is the disk model. You know, in the toy model, we use this simple, um, this simple uh, uh, exponential decrease, what we do in our model is a little bit more complex, but not so much actually. This is, we just solve this equation here, which describes the evolution of um, a viscous uh, accretion disk. So you model the disk as a rotating viscous uh, fluid. This is uh, by Linton Bell. We include photo evaporation and we include uh, also the accretion onto the planet. And then what you see is this kind of evolution, which is actually not so different from what we saw uh, yesterday, except here for the very end, because the photo evaporation is a little bit different. Then the second one is the planet solid accretion rate. So here we still use the old paradigm, which says that big planets grow, bigger objects grow by the accretion of planetesimals. Of course, we now see that there might be a paradigm shift going on. We heard that just before in the talk. So in this old kind of paradigm, how you describe this growth is, of course, by the Savranoff equation, so which is the uh, uh, rate equation for the planetary growth, which goes in here. So this is the rate of change, uh, the, the, the accretion rate. We have here the surface density of planetesimals. Here we have the capture radius. And here we have the gravitational focusing factor, which itself depends of the eccentricity and inclination of the small planetesimals. Then here in, uh, in r cap. This, here we need to take into account, and this is actually a very important process, is that these cores have a hydrogen helium envelope, and this makes, and this is similar as in the pebble accretion scenario, that the, the, the cross-section is significantly bigger than the solid core. Not as big as cores for, for these kilometer-sized objects as for the very small objects, uh, but it is already still um, quite strongly enhanced. What we also then have is the ejection of the planetesimals. And of course, for the pebbles, we are currently working on including that. And to give you uh, an idea how this looks like, I've brought here this small animation. So what we have here is an animation of an accreting Jupiter mass uh, a planet. So it accretes solid, but also gas. And what you have here is as a function of time. It's a little bit difficult to see. But this is the total mass. So we have this classical Pollock-like uh, 
uh, grows first of the solid core, then we have this, uh, this plateau, and then here we have the gas accretion. This is the, the mass of the core, and what we will now do is integrate the orbits of planetesimals in the gravity of the Sun and of the growing protoplanet, and let's see what happens. I hope it runs. Yes, so we have here we are in the, sen in the system rotating together with Jupiter and you see it car uh, carves here a, a gap into the planetesimal disks. We have here some Trojans at this point and at so soon it will undergo gas runaway accretion and things will fly apart. Now it should happen because its mass becomes very big so it has now accreted a lot because the feeding zone has extended a lot and uh, it has accreted mo much of this planetesimal except again those here which are uh, the Trojans, and when I first said, I said to my student, come on, what's that? We're dealing with gravity, how can you have something squared? That's impossible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but of course it has something to do with, 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 uh, with the um, mean motion resonances. Actually what you just find is, is that this here, this square, are objects which are in a 3 to 4 mean motion resonances, and these are this uh, Hilda-like 2 to 3, so this gives you this kind of funny shapes. Good. So he was right, I was wrong. Um, the, next, the, the next ingredient which, which we also looked at in, in, the, in the toy model is the accretion of the gas. And what we do, and this is one of the things which is relatively difficult to have it run for many, many different, uh, for many, many different uh, planets, this is the, the calculation of the gas accretion rate. And the way we calculate that is by solve the one-dimensional uh, structure equations and uh, I, I said that already in the hands-on session, so this is basically the same as the stellar structure equations. The difference is, of course, that we don't have hy hydrogen burning, but we have other sources of luminosity, and this is first uh, the uh, impacting planetesimals, that's important at the beginning, then we have, uh, okay, we have, of course, the contraction of the gaseous envelope itself, for ba massive ones, we have deuterium burning, and for the small ones, the radiogenic heating is also important. And there is one small parameter of which we will talk uh, later on. This is the opacity in the outer radiative zone, which regulates basically this, uh, the, the, the contraction rate, and this in turn then gives us the gas accretion rate. And what, what you see then if, is that this gas accretion rate becomes very fast once the planet approaches this magical 10 or something Earth mass, well, maybe it's only five or three, but several Earth's masses. And at this point, this, uh, this accretion rate given by the contraction of the planet becomes very big. So now, uh, the, it's now the disk which starts to limit the gas accretion rate because it can, of course, only give a finite, at uh, a finite rate, it can get give a gas to the protoplanet. And the way we model that is by saying that a certain fraction of the accretion rate in the disk can be accreted onto the star. This is just the expression for the accretion rate, uh, the viscous accretion rate in the disk. And of course, and this I made for Doug because he always insisted that the local disk can be accreted at a much higher rate, and therefore this year can be accreted at the Bondi rate. So I did that for you, Doug, but it didn't change much, but anyway. So, <laughs> and if you want to uh, then integrate this, this, um, these equations for the structure I just showed you before, to specify some boundary conditions and for a, pro for a giant planet, but also for a lower mass planet, which has hydrogen helium, there are three different phases. The first one is the so-called attach phase. That's when we are in this low mass regime. At this point, the gaseous envelope just expands smoothly into the background nebula so that our boundary conditions are just the disk, pressure and temperature. Then later on, when we are in this detached phase, so when the planet has contracted very quickly, now it is basically, uh, we have the, f the, the gas which is falling from the hill sphere on the surface where it shocks, so we have an accretion shock. This is very interesting because I was a few weeks back or two weeks ago at the LEO conference and they said that I could detect the planet in H alpha, so like you see uh, on the accretion onto the star, so this is, it would be fascinating if we could see this accretion shock. And then finally, the last stage for a giant planet is just evolutionary phase where it evolves at constant mass and there you can use some uh, atmospheric model. The simplest one would be just to use an Eddington gray atmosphere and this is what is done here. This is just evolution of Jupiter. So this is the pressure temperature profile. Here we have the temperature. So here it goes to the interior. This is just after formation when Jupiter is still hot, something like 1400 Kelvin and then in time it is just cooling off and this blue line is what was measured by the Galileo, Galileo probe, was it Galileo, which went into Jupiter, I think so, right? Yes, and this, so this, this works relatively well. Good, 
what I've brought, I'm, I'm always running this one-dimensional simulations, therefore I never can produce these nice movies like you can do in, in 3D or 2D, but I still tried here, and what I brought to you is this, this kind of animation. So this is, shows the formation and evolution of a uh, giant planet. I brought something a little bit more massive because it's more fun. It's a 15 Jupiter mass planet, and you have many panels here. So up here, these three panels, they show the temporal evolution. This one is the mass as a function of time, the total mass, the core mass, the envelope mass. Here we have the radius, total core and capture radius. And here you have the luminosity, the total, the deuterium burning, because I said it's a massive one, 15 Jupiter masses, so we will burn deuterium. And here the shock luminosity. Here we have some numerical data, like the mass, uh, the total mass, core mass, envelope mass, the radius, the luminosity. And this here is a little bit for the specialists. This is the internal structure. So as a function of the radius, we have the pressure and the temperature and the thick lines is there where it's convective. But this is a little bit less important. So let's, let's let it run. We see here the mass growing. At the, at the beginning, it's just accreting the planetesimals. And you, go, you see how it's going up. The luminosity is also relatively high. Uh, the, you cannot see the envelope because at this point, the envelope mass is really very, very small. Here we have the total, total radius, which is, is just the Hill sphere radius. During this time, we also see the typical structure, so in the inside convective and out, an outside radiative zone. So, oh, this goes too fast for me. So now the, this planet has now emptied its feeding zone. Therefore, the core luminosity has gone down. This means that we have less pressure support in the envelope. And therefore, now the accretion of gas has started. This is this line here. Uh, you also see we went through this maximum in the luminosity. This was the luminosity due to the accretion of the, of the planetesimals. And now soon you will see that the envelope and the core mass are the same, and this is the, uh, this is the crossover mass. This is, from the principle, is the same as the critical mass, so we expect at this moment the whole accretion process of gas will speed up. And I think you will see that right now. So you see how now these lines almost become vertically, and uh, you see, duck, and now the planet has, 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 has had such a high accretion rate that it wanted more than the, the, the disk can give. Therefore, it needed to detach from the nebula. And this is what you see in the radius. This has here now really uh, decreased by a very large factor down to just two Jupiter radii. You also see that now the luminosity has gone through this huge, uh, or is increasing by a lot. Uh, Jupiter luminosity, I think, uh, one Jupiter luminosity is 10 to the minus nine or something, solar luminosities. And so we are here at percent of the, of the solar luminosities. Um, here at this point, the luminosity is given by the accretion shock, but now our mass is already so big that also the deuterium burning has started in the interior. And now I will just, when we are reached these 15 Jupiter masses, I have just switched off the accretion. This has happened right now. I need to stop that. So, so uh, usually this end of accretion is given either by the formation of the gap or by the dissipation of the protoplanetary disk. Here I've just said I want to have 15 Jupiter masses. So I stopped it and at this moment the accretion shock luminosity went away. And now you see something interesting here. The deuterium burning luminosity is bigger than the total luminosity. And how is this possible? Well, it is used to expand the planet. So we will see that it is... Here the radius is increasing a little bit again. Now we see we are in a phase where the luminosity, the total luminosity is the same as the deuterium burning luminosity. If we had more deuterium burning, we would now be on the main sequence, but of course we run out of deuterium relatively quickly. And therefore from this moment on, we just have the contraction and the cooling. You see this is the central temperature. It's half a million Kelvin and now it's going down and now it's just cooling and becoming slower and we can wait until we go to a few billion years. So it goes down, down, and 10 bigger years. And now the star explodes, and that's it. So that's how we model such uh, the formation evolution of a giant planet in these simple one-dimensional models. OK, good. Let's go back a little bit more to uh, population synthesis itself. So uh, I told you that the second most ingredient are these probability distributions, and I already mentioned them quickly. Let's go look at them in a little bit more detail. So the first of them is the, is the metallicity. So and we assume that is the metallicity, to the dust to gas ratio, is the same in the disk as also in in the, in, the, in the host star. And then we can look, of course, we can measure the metallicities of, of stars. And this is shown here. So this black line is just 
the distribution of metallicities in the solar neighborhood of solar-like stars. It's a Gaussian in, in F over H with this mean and this, this sigma. And then the distribution, and this is the same that you're also using for the toy model, is just this here. It's a fit to that. Then the second one is the disk gas mass. Here we do something which is not really self-consistent because, you know, it's difficult to measure gas masses. So what we actually do, we look at the distribution of dust masses and then we add gas in a, with a factor 100. And if you do that here, that's for Ophiuchus, that's by Sean Andrews, you have this kind of distribution. And of course, we are theoreticians, so we just put in some uh, normal, log normal distribution because it's easy. And then we draw from this distribution the disk masses. The third random uh, uh, um, Monte Carlo variable for this population synthesis is the disk lifetime. Or it's not strictly the disk lifetime in our model. We, the disk evolves through to, to the alpha viscosity and the external photo evaporation. So what we did, we uh, took a distribution of, disk li of photo evaporation rates so that the distribution of synthetic disk lifetimes is similar as the distribution of actual disk lifetimes. And this is shown here. This is from this is the fa famous Heisch Lada plot. So what you have here is as a function of h, the fraction of stars in a young cluster which shown in infrared excess, and you see this decrease. This is a more recent version and. Uh, the, so what we do is to, to then to change, to, to adjust the photo evaporation distribution so that our synthetic disk have a disk lifetime distribution which is, which is similar as observed. And then we draw from this way all the initial conditions. We also put it embryos. What we now do at the beginning, we put them uniform in log because that's what you accept from, expect from the runaway uh, growth uh, regime. And now we put 10 of them, again, with a probability which is uniform in log. And what do we get here? So here is a, then this formation tracks. We saw that in the very first talk of the meeting already. So we have a semi-major axis. And here we have the mass. We have here 10 embryos per disk, which start at 1% of the, of the, of the Earth's mass. Uh, it's around the solar-like star. Migration is uh, included with non-isothermal type 1 migration. And this is a full and body integrator. This color gives you the composition of the core, so icy or rocky. And let's see what happens. So this is also very quickly. So you see that we have here uh, the planets, which of course they grow and they go up, and at the same time they migrate. And you see for a, a number of different cases, these planets here, they migrate relatively slowly. That's because they are uh, in the non-isothermal uh, migration, and therefore they are captured in these so-called convergence zones, of which uh, Richard and also Doug were talking. Therefore, they migrate relatively small, despite the fact that they are in type 1 migration. Then, when we go to about the mass of uh, close to 10 Earth masses, you see that they make something like that. That's because at this point, the corrotation torques tend to saturate, and then the full type 1, the Lindblad, takes over and brings them very quickly uh, close to the star. But in some cases, they can also start at this point a gas runaway accretion, and then they make rather something, a trajectory which goes up here, and this brings them in this region here. And you maybe wonder why they make like that. That's because they are interacting gravitationally with other planets in this regime. You also see here again this uh, planetary desert, so there are not many planets in this part. Some get here at the very end of the disk lifetimes. And if we then look at typical distributions we have at the end in the mass distance diagram, and what I uh, forgot to mention is that most of our disks, uh, of our systems that we get are relatively compact. I think we will hear, hear that later on again. And also they have relatively low eccentricities. Um, still we have also some uh, ejected, uh, some ejected planets, and this is uh, an example of a student who is working on that currently. So this ex assumes that the eccentricity and inclination damping time scale is just 10% of the migration time scale, and then you get just a handful of uh, planets at larger distances. This here uses longer time scales for the for the damping of uh, Crossfeld and Nelson, and then we get a larger number of pla giant planets at at uh, large distances, something like 5.8 for 5.8% of, uh, of the stars have such a, a planet. And we can make some uh, comparison with results for direct imaging surveys. So for example, here they inferred uh, a frequency of 1 to 3% for planets between 5 to 70 Earth masses at this semi-major axis range. And here we will get 0.4% 
and here we will get 3.6%. So you see this, but these are highly eccentric objects. So this, but this tells, shows you how we can use uh, constraints from different uh, uh, techniques. So let's move to another uh, very important output of the population synthesis models, and this is certainly the planetary initial mass function. So at the moment when the disk disappears, and this is what we find, and, and the other models find qualitatively similar things. So we have first this very large peak of low mass planets, then we have here a small bump of Neptunian mass planets. These are planets which have migrated through the disk, accreting most of the solid in the disk, but without undergoing gas runaway accretion. And then here we have the planetary desert, and now I can explain what I mean with that. I mean, once we are uh, significantly beyond 10 Earth's mass, and the accretion luminosity is not too high, then the rapid gas accretion sets in, and this happens on a time scale which is clearly shorter than the disk lifetime. Therefore, it's unlikely that the disk goes away exactly in this time. Therefore, you move relatively quickly from here into the giant planet part. This is this shape here, and finally here we have uh, a, a tail of super Jupiters. So it's a relatively complex structure, but it's of course very dominated by the low mass planets and you can then make some numbers and you again see that uh, the super Earths are about 61% uh, or Earths and super Earths, Jovian about 13% uh, and uh, this is a little bit old, I could uh, take that away. At the time where we all mostly had giant planets, I could only say, ah, this is only the tip, and then and all the observers said, ah, we need to have a, bigger, a better radial velocity precision, and this, this worked. So at least this kind of prediction was, was, was more or less right. Well, it was expected, of course. But still, if we now look at the result which we have, and this is uh, the result of the big HARP survey by Michel Mayor, uh, which has probably the best radial velocity precision right now. This is a bias-corrected, uh, this distribution of the, of the masses and of course what they also see is this huge increase towards the small masses. And I think what is really interesting from a theoretical point of view is that this change in slope seems to occur something at about 30 Earth's masses. And I think this is really a very typical imprint. I mean, I'm not sure if it's really this, but that, at least in our model, and in, I think in every core accretion model, you expect something like that to happen. Because 30 Earth's masses, this is again, your core is about 15 Earth's masses, your envelope is about 15 Earth's masses. This is at the crossover point. This is when you start to accrete the gas rapidly, and you really change the physics that determine uh, your masses. And what is good, if we extend here, even smaller, there is still a lot to uh, discover if you believe this kind of models. So I said from, uh, from population synthesis we can learn something about the physics and one example is exactly this transition be between the solid and the, and the gaseous planets because I told you here we have this fast process. Let's look at two simulations which differ in the way this how fast this, this, this uh, gas accretion is at the beginning and then we look at what kind of distribution of masses we get. And this is shown here. So in, in the dotted line uh, is a simulation where the accretion of gas in at the beginning is, not, is limited always uh, by the disk uh, um, rate, which is a little bit slower, so we cannot accrete as fast. While here we have a, a little bit of different prescription, and then you can see we get a deeper gap. So you, from the way the mass function looks like, you can learn something about the Kelvin-Helmholtz uh, time scale dependency or the, the, the processes that limit the gas accretion in the disk. A second example, what we can learn, this is the upper end of the planetary mass function. This is controlled by the disk masses, the disk lifetime, and the gap formation. And if you look at hydro simulation, what they find is typically this. So this is the mass of the planet, and this is uh, the accretion rate, and you can see the bigger you get, the smaller the accretion rate, this is what we have in the toy model, basically. So you would expect that this is a self-regulating uh, process, but we also know that sufficiently massive planets, they can uh, cause this eccentric, eccentric ex instability. And the, you see this here, this is a simulation of, of Cly, of Willy Cly. And in this moment, the planet can restart to accrete. And then you're basically only limited by how much gas you have in the disk. And this is also something you can try to parameterize and put in your population synthesis. And these are then the upper parts of the planetary mass function here with gap limitation. And then you produce planets which are at the maximum maybe seven or so 
Jupiter masses, while if you, have not, you don't have this limitation, you get rather this kind of slope, and this is actually closer uh, to the observation. Okay, another nice and I think important aspect of the population synthesis is that, of course, you know, in contrast to reality, what were the initial conditions. What were the disk properties? And this is shown here. So this is, shows the planetary mass function, but now for three different metallicity bins. This is for high, medium, and low metallicity. And what you can see that for high metallicity, we have a higher number of giant planets, but they are not more massive. And that's because the metallicity mostly just controls the threshold, but not the final mass. This is different if we then look at the disk masses. Green is, again, high disk masses. And here you clearly see that in high gas disk mass, we also have massive planets. And finally, this for the disk lifetime. And you can see for long li disk lifetimes, you have both more and also more massive planets. And that's because you have more time to grow your critical core. But in our disk, in our model at least, the more uh, the more massive disks have also a long disk lifetime, therefore you can also accrete more gas. And this is something which you can at least partially compare with observation, and this is, uh, I think, one, another very important result of uh, the population synthesis. So this here is the metallicity effect, so this is stellar metallicity, and this here is the fraction with uh, giant planets, and the red and green are observational data, and the black one here is the synthetic result and you see there is a similar trend but it's a weaker dependency so there could be other mechanisms maybe on the formation of the planetesimals itself and I think this is one in, in argument in favor of core accretion as the mechanism producing most of the planets and this was found before already by Shigeru and Doug but even Doug is now more no more convinced that this is the full story but anyway so uh, you can do the, the same thing here for the disk mass you see here it's also increasing, approximately linear, linear, and finally also for the disk lifetime. We also can then look at this dependency, not only for giant planets, but also for the lower mass planets, because this is another very interesting and constraining result. We heard that also before. So here we have a histogram, again for a radial velocity survey of all stars. This is this blue, uh, this, this blue line, yes, and then this black line is the histograms of the metallicities of those stars which have a giant planet and you see this is clearly shifted to the high metallicity is the same what we saw in the previous plot and here we have the metallicities of those host stars which have a low mass planet and it is not shifted to the higher metallicities. And if we then compare that with some uh, population synthesis result, we see something which is at least a little bit similar. Here the black line is all, plan all, all stars or all planets. And here we have then in red the low mass planets and they have almost, this is the mean of the distribution. Here if we go to more massive, uh, it's 0.06, and finally, if we go to the giant planets, it's moved by almost 0.2 dex to higher metallicity. So you see that here we have a, a, at least a similar trend, and I, I think it's clear because for the giant planet course, we need to have much mass because we need to form them early on, and we need to form them massive. Uh, for the lower mass planets, we, we don't need that. We can also grow them after the disk, and we don't need simply that much mass. Good. Let's go to the last six slides of my talk, and this is no more about the radii. I mean, we heard about Kepler and all the new information uh, we got from it, and of course this is really very important, and therefore what we tried in the last few years is to extend our population synthesis model from a pure formation uh, mo model into an evolutionary model, and this evolution, I mean the thermodynamic evolution, so the evolution of the radii and the luminosity, because then we can also compare with the results from, uh, um, from uh, transit observations and from direct imaging observations. So the idea is to look at this diagram, so the mass radius relation. And what we see here is, of course, a general trend here with mass, the radius gets bigger, but we also see that there for one mass, there is a very big diversity. We have here that, for example, the giant, uh, inflated giant planets, and there are also empty reasons. And what we wonder is whether we can try to understand, whether we can understand that, again, from uh, the core accretion paradigm. And um, the idea is that with that we can learn additional constraints we cannot get from the mass distance diagram itself. And what I mean with that is especially something about opacity, we say that later on, but also atmospheric uh, escape. And for that we must, as I said, we must combine formation and evolution. 
So let's see, this takes long time to load. Is it already loading? Well, uh, I was too fast. I feel that. Let's go back. It's too many points. So this is why it takes so long. Is it doing something? Mm. Yes. OK. I hope that's it. This is, so this is the, no. <laughs> anyway, we can also, you saw it for a second. So what you have here is the mass of the planet. And this here is its radius. And this is time, again, for a population synthesis. And you maybe remember that we have these two phases. First, in the attached phase, where the radius is very big, it's the Hill sphere radius. And then later on, the planet contracts very quickly when it becomes a giant planet. This is what we see here, because we can try to follow one of the, mm, why is it this? Is, Yes, OK, good. So this is, if you would follow the track of one planet, this is first at the beginning, so it grows. And then its radius is given by the Hill sphere. The Hill sphere scales with the mass of the planet. Therefore, it goes up. Then we have this collapse. Then it goes here. If it, it continues to grow, it's more or less horizontal. This has something to do with the degenerate in the interior. And then when it uh, becomes very massive, then it undergoes deuterium fusion, and it becomes bigger again. We saw that also in the simulation. And let's see how this goes on in time, if it goes. The calculation takes even much longer, so we must accept to wait. So this is at 5 million years. What you can see is basically the same thing, except these planets are less numerous. Why is that? That's simply because most of the disk have, or a large fraction, have already disappeared by then. Then we move one step further. I don't know, it never takes that long on my own when I don't show it. I don't know what it is. So one, at the, here we are at 10 million years, and now almost all disks are gone. We have only a handful of planets up here. And from now on, the mass is constant. So now they all go just down, if they go. Yes, 20 million years. And we have here the deuterium burning acting. Uh, those here have already burned it. The, these are in the process of burning it. This gives this funny shape. And now. I don't know what to say. There is not so much information on this plot. Um, so 50 million years, I would like to go to 5 giga years. 100. So now you see this effect is becoming slower. Well, I can already discuss it a little bit, some other aspects. You, for example, see here the color code. Oh, I didn't even explain it. So what it means is the fraction of heavy elements of the total mass of the planet. And black here means that more than 99% of the planet's mass are solids. And this, this uh, gold or uh, orange means that it is less than 5%. And you see that we have here this clear imprint uh, of, 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 of core accretion. We can then compare that also with observations. Namely, that these low mass planets, they are clearly dominated by solids. And that's because, of course, the kelvin helmholtz timescale of these planets is long. Therefore, they cannot accrete a lot of gas, which explains that we don't have planets here. And we don't have planets here neither, because this would be pure uh, rocky planets of several hundred Earth masses. This doesn't exist. Well, first of all, it's difficult to have so many, so many solids. But even then, if the core grows very massive, they accrete hydrogen, helium, and then they move up here. So we don't have uh, planets down there. If you look at the distribution, this is what we find. So we have a very strong increase towards the small radii, which is not surprising after we have seen the, uh, the, the, the mass function. But what is interesting, we have also this peak here. And I still hope that Kepler is going to find it. This was a nice prediction, because it's an easy prediction. Because if you think again of the mass radius relation, there is a large part where the radius is more or less independent of the mass between, let's say, the mass of Saturn or a little bit more, up to 10 Jovian masses, the radius is all one uh, Jupiter radius. And therefore, many planets get into this beam. But here in this simulation, it's, it's, it's exaggerated because they all have the same opacity and there is no bloating included. But maybe, uh, I think, it's, we will find still that there is, a, there, is a, there is a second maximum in the distribution. Good. I said that from the, this radius calculations, we can learn uh, additional constraints on the planet formation process. And one of them is the hydrogen helium mass fraction. And these are a number of observational uh, results, or the theoretical and observation results, which try to infer that. For example, let's take here this result of uh, Lopez and Fortney, where they have the mass and they showed the composition, so the fraction of hydrogen helium, which they get from modeling the interior. And what you can see is that the hydrogen helium mass fraction increases with mass. This is here. 
uh, from the population synthesis or core accretion. I mean, it's not really population synthesis, but there you get something similar. But here, the theoretical results, this depends on this grain opacity. I, I mentioned that uh, before. So uh, if the opacity is, is low, then we can accrete a lot of gas for a given core mass. And if the opacity is high, then, uh, then it's difficult to accrete. And there are theoretical models for that, numerical grain dynamics models or analytical models. And this is quite rich physics because they can coagulate, they can sink, they can fragment. But this is an example which is difficult to constrain by observations. But here, if you build it in into the population synthesis, you can maybe make some uh, link to the observations. And this is what is done here. So here you see again three mass radius relationships. And they are the same except for the opacity in the protoplanetary envelope. And this here is for grain-free, so low opacities, only gas, molecular opacities. Then this is reduced by 0.003. This is a fit to more complex models. And finally, this is for, for full interstellar medium opacities. And even though the effect is not very big, but you see here that here we have observed planets which are below the synthetic planets, and this means that this, our synthetic planets are too large. That's because they were too efficient in accreting hydrogen helium. So we would say here the opacity is too low, then here we have something which is more or less similar, and finally for this high opacity, the synthetic planets are below the observation, and this could be a sign that this opacity is too big compared to the observation result. And I think this is a nice example, although there are certainly other effects which are acting, but this is an example how we can get observation constraint on microphysical, uh, on microphysical pr uh, um, processes from the observation via the population synthesis. And this brings me to, to my conclusion. So population synthesis is really a tool. It's not, I mean, the interest is not in the population synthesis itself. It is a, it is a tool uh, which can help to compare theory in the observation to improve our understanding. And this is because with it, we can really use the full wealth uh, of observation constraints that we have, and we can put detailed models uh, to the test, and we can see their st global statistical consequences. Um, we have seen a number of examples of how we can relate these population results from population synthesis on uh, some processes like the accretion of the gas or the, grind, uh, the grain dynamics. I didn't talk much about orbital migration rate, but this is something you can do then in the hands-on session. What is also interesting is it we can see the link between the, prop the disk properties and the, protoplanet and the planet properties, and it also uh, can be used to predict the yields of future instruments. And one thing is very important to understand, I already said that, these population synthesis models, they really depend on the progress of uh, planet formation theory of the field as a whole, because they consist of all the distilled parts in, in the, of the whole field. And this means, of course, that they are continuously evolving and that there is, of course, also a lot uh, to do still. Thank you very much. Um, I think the, he was right in the sense that um, there are, have not been a lot of... Ah, the question was... <laughs> the question was... <laughs> what was the question? No, the question was, uh, Scott, on the first day, he, he said that there is a lot to do to, the, to improve, basically, the, the link between the, the observation and the theoretical part, that we have not yet done our homework in that, and what could be done on both the theoretical and the observational side. And I think he is, is really right. Um, there have not been that many really quantitative comparisons, mostly it's just looking at the things. Uh, um, but especially in the last two or three years, there was really a lot of work on the observational side where I think people have tried to correct. Uh, we saw that the, the corrected radial velocity mass distribution, there was a lot of work to get the real, the underlying unbiased Kepler radius distribution. So I think so, uh, on the observation side, a lot of uh, is done in this direction. And now it is probably our part to, to really make the quantitative uh, comparison. But uh, I mean, I often get requests, ah, can you send me the population? And I'm, I'm very interested in that. And we are working uh, on, a, on a website where it will be possible to download and access all these synthetic populations. We have not specially dealt with that. I mean, we always... Uh, the question was how we deal with... 
how we deal with, with the, the planets which are the small at the small uh, semi-major axis, like Kepler finds them, how do we, can we still use the one-dimensional approach to model them? So in our model, what we use as the outer boundary is always the minimum of one third of the Hill sphere and the, the Bondi radius. So, so some effect is kind of included, but probably this is not really sufficient. So we, 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 we always use, I mean, I mentioned that our model comes really from the standard Pollock model, and we still work, it still inherits some of the assumptions which are coming from there. Um, how often do we build a system that looks like the solar system? Um, our system tend to be more compact all the time, almost all the time. Um, they, we don't have um, something like uh, the migration, outside, uh, outward migration, uh, if, if for planets in mean motion resonances. Uh, so we cannot have a situation like the Masse and Snell groove mechanisms for the, for the Grand TAC. Um, we get simulations, uh, situations, but I cannot give you the number, but I can look it up, which look, which have a configuration when if you have, would have this outward migration, you have two giant planets which are similar like uh, Jupiter and Saturn and two or three additional uh, Neptunian planets. So this could be an initial conditions for the Grand Tech, but I cannot give you a number for that. We are working on that. I, I mean, you know, in this 1D model, you cannot have uh, uh, outward migration in type two. And now we replace that by a uh, two dimensional disk model to, to be able to have that. Because probably for the, for the solar system, it's, it's, I, I could believe it's important. 